Japan's longest serving leader bounced out. Shinzo Abe is resigning due to illness. Don't give up hope. This pandemic will pass. Culture, Community and Youth Minister Edwin Tong tells us young Singaporeans are well placed to thrive in the future. And heading out to sea for the first swim, Singapore releases more than 100 critically endangered turtles. Hello, you're watching The Big Story, coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom. I'm Olivia Kuei. And I'm Harianto Dimana. You can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. Now, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe today announced that he's resigning due to health issues. During a news conference in Tokyo, he revealed that his chronic illness, ulcerative colitis, a disease affecting the intestines, has worsened. For now, he continues in the job until a successor is chosen. Mr Abe holds the record of being Japan's longest-serving premier, a post he has held since December 2012. Now, this would be the second time that he has called it quits. In 2007, just one year into his first term, he resigned over similar health problems. Rumours about Mr Abe's resignation intensified after two recent hospital visits for medical checks. During his premiership, he championed what's internationally referred to as Abenomics to turn around the country's deflation. Singapore and Japan enjoy strong ties. Last October, President Halima Yaakob paid a visit to Tokyo where she held talks with Mr Abe. He referred to Madam Halima as a role model for being Singapore's first female Speaker of Parliament and then President. Well, back home, nearly half of employees of Suntec Singapore Convention and Exhibition Centre have been retrenched amid the ongoing decimation of the mice industry, which is short for meetings, incentives, conventions and exhibitions. The 85 retrenched workers comprise 60 Singaporeans and permanent residents and 25 foreign staff members. They were employed in food production, sales and events, human resources and finance. With the retrenchment exercise, Suntec Singapore will have a remaining workforce of 89 local staff and 4 foreign staff. Since February, Suntec Singapore has explored cost-cutting measures including hiring freezes, shorter work weeks and temporary salary reductions in the form of unpaid leave. Non-essential spending has also been eliminated and the management has also taken up to 40% in pay cuts. The mice industry is one of the most hard-hit sectors during the COVID-19 pandemic, triggering a domino effect on Singapore's tourism, hospitality, F&B and tourist-dependent retailers. We want to know more about the current situation in the mice industry, which has been severely hit with events suspended since April. We're pleased to welcome Mr. Aloysius Salando to the show. Now, he's the president of the Singapore Association of Convention and Exhibition Organizers and Suppliers. Now, he's also the CEO of venue management company SingX, which operates Singapore Expo and Max Atria. Welcome to the show again, Aloysius. Now, let me preface uh, the first question by saying that we know it's pretty impossible to compare the SARS and COVID-19 crises. The mice sector was at a different, possibly more latent stage back in 2003, and we're living uh, as well in a completely different digital age. Having said that though, in what ways does your experience in weathering the SARS outbreak inform how the industry can recover and function post-COVID-19? Preparedness is very key. And I think the SARS episode had enabled us to to see what are the ways and measures we have to be, uh, have to put in place in order for us to be prepared for this crisis. Uh, as you rightly put, this has been uh, vastly different from the SARS episode. Uh, it has prolonged. It is no longer four or five months. And I think the end is still not in sight, which means preparation and therefore what does survival and recovery look like? I think that's one of the key things that uh, is is guiding us uh, in this journey to ride out this uh, crisis. Hmm. Well, just, the Singapore Tourism Board is uh, trialling a hybrid format for business events uh, with on-site attendance of up to 50 people plus virtual attendance of many others. Mm -hmm. The pilot event was just uh, held earlier this week. Do you expect events to look like this in the future and for how long you think? I think we, we are still trying to discover what the future of events would be. 
uh, indeed because of the simple reason that we cannot meet uh, and travel and border restrictions are closed or are in place. Uh, it means that we will need to engage uh, people near and far digitally. The extent of what hybrid means is also up in the air. What we need to think about is using these pilots, how can we operate in a, in a safe and a hygienic environment? Uh, at the same time, what are the key considerations we have to put in place both digitally and physically such that it becomes, uh, it makes commercial sense for businesses and enterprises to embark uh, on hybrid platforms? Right. So Aloysius, um, then in that case, are you able to project like um, a time frame as to how long these hybrid events might go on for? Yeah, I think it depends also on how long this, this crisis will, mm. will take. Uh, projections um, have yielded somewhere between two, three, or even four years. Uh, I think IATA, the International Air Transport Association, has also said that uh, aviation might come back to some form of pre-COVID levels in four years' time. That's, that's in, in, I guess, in, in COVID timelines, it's a pretty long timeline, which means uh, we have to think about what is the best hybrid solution for each and every enterprise. Uh, and it's definitely going to have these two dimensions of physical and digital. Uh, Luscious, just to round up uh, today's discussion, is the industry getting enough help, especially if the government wants Singapore to maintain its hub status as the Trade and, Minis Trade and Industry Ministry said this week? I think that has always been the aspiration. Singapore is indeed a global Asian node and we want to make it uh, not just uh, a note for today, but also for tomorrow's success. Um, and therefore, the government has been extremely um, supportive of the of the industry. Uh, we can see that through the four budgets uh, that have been shared, uh, the recent being the Fortitude budget. And I think the job support scheme has been very, um, sub very uh, well received. Um, but I think what's important is also what do we do from here onwards? Um, if the virus and if the if COVID is going to take a long time, we can't simply live on handouts. So we need to also think about how do we become resilient? What are the business models we need to think about? And how do we pivot ourselves in order to look at new ways uh, to generate uh, revenues and also to ensure that cost is kept in check so that we can restart uh, our businesses, uh, not just in a safe and responsible manner, but also in a sustainable manner. Right. Well, Aloysius, we wish you and your colleagues all the very best. And of course, thank you so much for joining us today. We've been speaking to Aloysius Orlando, who's president of the Singapore Association of Convention and Exhibition Organizers and Suppliers. Now on to the latest COVID-19 figures in Singapore. 94 new cases were confirmed today. They included four community cases. There were also 10 imported cases among the remaining 80 cases residing in dormitories. 58 are from Sungai Tengah Lodge and they had been quarantined earlier. The Health Ministry said the vast majority of them were tested during quarantine to determine their status or were picked up through rostered routine testing. The Sungai Tengah Lodge cluster was announced on August 22nd and after it was detected, MOH placed about 4,500 workers on quarantine and has tested about 3,000 of them so far. The Ministry expects the number of cases from the dorm to remain high in the coming days until testing of the rest of the quarantine workers is completed. In other local news, Le Teck Siang, the doctor involved in the infamous HIV registry data leak case last year, lost his appeal today against his conviction for drug-related offences. He was sentenced to 15 months jail in October last year on two charges, one for injecting a drug abuser with methamphetamine for a fee and the other for possess possessing a drug-stained syringe. The sentence for the drug offences was ordered to run after Le finishes serving his two-year term for helping his former HIV-positive American partner McCabe Ferrari Brochet cheat the authorities into issuing a work pass. Meanwhile, Compulsory Care Shield Life will start on October 1st for all residents born in 1980 or later, meaning those 40 years old or younger this year. Under the scheme, they will start paying annual premiums using their Medishave accounts on 
reaching their 30th birthday and stop paying at the age of 67. They continue to be covered for the rest of their lives even after they stop paying the premiums. People who don't have enough money in their Medisave may use money from their spouse's account or that of an approved family member. There is also government subsidy. Singaporeans and permanent residents with registered SingPass accounts will receive digital push notifications from the Immigration and Checkpoints Authority on IC and passport-related matters from September 1st. These notifications will be sent either to their SingPass mobile app or as an SMS to the mobile number registered in their SingPass account. They can then click on the link to begin their transactions or check on the outcome of their applications. Singapore residents who don't have a SingPass account will continue to receive hard copy letters or emails for such notifications. Public libraries will resume regular open, opening hours from next Tuesday, September 1st, but with capacity controls in place. The National Library Building, National Archives of Singapore Building and all public libraries will open from 10am to 9pm daily except on public holidays. Libraries and shopping malls, meanwhile, will open from 11am to 9pm. Visits will continue to be limited to 30 minutes and capacity remains capped at 50 people per floor. Patrons can only borrow and return materials. Now, as Singapore navigates its way through the COVID-19 pandemic, more needs to be done to build a strong social compact between the government and the people. That's the message from the Ministry's Addenda released today. For a start, more opportunities will be created for Singaporeans to engage in respectful dialogue on sensitive issues of race and religion. While well, multimedia journalist Dylan Ang catches up with Mr Edwin Tong, Minister for Culture, Community and Youth. Uh, let's get straight into it. Your ministry's addendum um, spoke of building social capital as well as inspiring the Singapore spirit. How does MCCY plan to partner and engage with Singaporeans um, to do so, you know, given the stresses on society and economy uh, brought upon by the COVID-19 pandemic? I think over successive generations, we have built up the Singapore spirit, we built up cohesion in our mm. society. Of course, today with the pandemic, it's meant that people are a lot more concerned about their jobs, their family, personal finances, and I think that's understandable. Mm -hmm. So the thinking might well have shifted from something that's more unity and cohesion, collectivity, to worrying a bit more about self-preservation and self-interest. I think that's understandable in the current climate, but if it pro progresses in the long term, that's going to cause a problem. So we have to think in terms of how we can bring people together. And I think MCCY is uniquely placed because we are really at the crossroads and intersection of different groups in society, mm. in the community, and I think we can play a facilitation role. We can bring people together, discuss the trade-offs, understand what the issues are. And I think we, it's important to chart a collective way forward. And uh, we need to do a lot more of this in uh, months, uh, maybe in a year to come as well. Mm. Well, you know, certain segments of society, especially uh, young people, uh, have shown that they want things to be done a little bit differently, uh, where, whereas you know, others may be a bit uncomfortable with the pace of change. How does the government plan to forge a consensus you know, between the two groups, uh, especially in a world that has, is becoming increasingly polarised? Yeah, I think some of the problems today is that we have a lot more uh, connectivity, mm. but a lot less communication. And I think that's sometimes the cause of polarization and problems. Young people, I think, always have a interest in the future. That's in their nature. And they have every right to say that they have a stake in national policies, nation building, mm -hmm. and they want to have a say. And I think quite rightly so. The young people, I think, uh, are more expressive, but it doesn't mean that the older generation, the other people in society, don't share the same agenda. Mm. I think everyone wants the same end outcome. And I would say that there are different paths, different roads we can take, but I would like to think that they all lead to the same place where we want to build a stronger, more cohesive society, a community that's more united. And I think one where we can sustain the both the short-term and the long-term challenges and end up with a Singapore that is continues to be rich, continues to be a place that people can call home for generations to come. Mm. And I think that same end game is common across whether you are younger or older, 
in society. Mm. Now, Minister, you know, speaking of young people, uh, MCCY's addendum also states that a, a new digital core uh, will be created to help community and social sector organisations to digitalise. Are there any particular uh, segments in the community that the core will target, and if so, why? So MCCY and the uh, National Youth Council will look to recruit and train uh, in the first instance about a thousand places mm. for young people to come forward and learn the tools of trade to digitalize. The idea behind it really is so that they can then fan out into society, into the community sectors and social sectors and help upscale. Uh, one example of course is in the area of charities. I think this period we've seen a decline in donations Partly because charities rely on a very face-to-face -face mm. interfacing and, and dealing. So uh, helping them to upscale digital, go online, I think will be useful. And this is the kind of sector that we look for. Mm. Mm. Well, Minister, just to end off, you know, what are some issues that you feel particularly strongly about and, and you like hope to take forward during your term as MCCY Minister? Well, in the immediate future, I think three things uh, I would like to focus on. Mm. The first is for young people. It's a challenging time, but I would say to them, don't give up hope. This pandemic will pass, and my ministry will do what we can to support your aspirations and ideals. And whether you want to be a dancer or a doctor or a sportsman or social media influencer, we have the pipeline to help you fulfill that dream. Mm. So young people, don't give up hope. Second, in the area of arts, uh, and two things for that. The first is we must continue on our path to be a first-class arts centre, whether it's in production or in performance, and making sure that we also are in a position to export talent. We also want to build in the heartlands an appreciation of arts as well. It's not just for the uh, fancy occasions and... Uh, where you've got to dress up, you've got to go to a performance. I think mm. we want to bring it to the heartlands. Mm. And actually, in some ways, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to digitalize and to reformulate the art form into a different package so that we can reach out more. So I'd like to do that uh, with the art sector. And the last is in sports. I think now more than ever, we need someone to inspire us, to show us the way, and to really show us what it means to work hard, to have grit and resilience determination and I think sports people and sports events have that capacity. We might not be able to fill up the national stadium today <laughs> but I think there's a sportsman in all of us whether you're an everyday Singaporean or you're a high performance athlete whether you're the individual trying to reach your personal best in a marathon or you're one of our high performance athletes trying to get that Olympic medal mm. next year. Mm. I think we can all use sports to rally behind our country and to really build that Singapore spirit. Mm. Well, thank you, Minister, for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you very much for having me. In the global headlines, Donald Trump has accepted the Republican nomination for a second term as U.S. president. Speaking at the White House, he argued that unlike Joe Biden, his administration focuses on the science, the facts and the data to tackle the coronavirus pandemic. And Mr. Trump attacked his Democratic rival as someone who will destroy American greatness. Joe Biden and his party repeatedly assailed America as a land of racial, economic, and social injustice. So tonight, I ask you a simple question. How can the Democrat Party ask to lead our country when it spends so much time tearing down our country? Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison says he is open to allowing the Christchurch Moss gunman Brenton Tarrant to serve his life sentence in his native Australia, but has not yet received a request from New Zealand. New Zealand's Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters had earlier said that Australia should take back the gunman who was yesterday sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. According to a source familiar with the matter, Goldman Sachs Group has made the 2.5 billion US dollar payment it pledged to the Malaysian government to settle allegations of misconduct related to 1MDB. Malaysia plans to use the funds to help repay 1MDB's outstanding debt, including 3.5 billion dollars of bonds due in 2022 and 2023, which are now held under the finance ministry. 
Now, on the coronavirus front, South Korea is extending phase two measures for at least another week, stopping short of imposing the highest level of social distancing. The country has seen triple digit increases in daily cases after church clusters spread to a political rally early, earlier this month. And the tropical island of the coast of Brazil is reopening to travellers next month. But there's a catch. Fernando de Noronha is only letting in visitors who have had COVID-19. Unlike the rest of the country, the island hasn't had a community case in a long time and officials want to keep it that way. Finally, a cute animal story to end the week. After penguins yesterday, it's turtles today. Baby turtles. That's right. 119 critically endangered hawks-built turtle hatchlings were released at Sisters Island by the National Parks Board last Sunday after they had had their vital statistics recorded. A new clutch of hawks-built turtle eggs were also relocated from East Coast Park to the island's Marine Park Turtle Hatchery. National Development Minister Desmond Lee, who shared the video on Facebook, says he hopes the baby turtles will grow and return to our shores soon. Now for more news and videos, do visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman with Olivia Kwe. Have a good weekend and we'll see you on Monday.